Uh, thanks, Angus. And uh, thanks also for the speakers in the last panel and to Ben. And I think they really show that there is a coherent alternative to equilibrium, but it involves a lot more turbulence and instability and uh, equilibrium can emerge or not. But that leads us perfectly into the next session, which is causes uh, for instability and indeed cures. And our chair is going to be Carola Binder, and she's an assistant professor in the Haverford College Department of Economics and an associate editor at the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking. So Carola, over to you. Hi, welcome to everyone in the audience. Um, I'm really thrilled to be chairing this panel. We have some really fantastic speakers, um, Nick Chater, Robert McKay, and Roger Farmer. Um, and I'm excited to hear their thoughts about the causes and cures of instability. Of course, this is a hugely important topic as policymakers around the world are deciding how to respond um, to the COVID-19 pandemic and to prepare for future shocks. Now, the period from the mid 1980s until around 2007 is often called the great moderation. This was a period of relatively low macroeconomic um, volatility and seemingly high stability in um, many advanced economies. And in 2004, Ben Bernanke remarked that um, most explanations for the great moderation fall into one of the following categories. First would be structural changes that improve the ability of the economy to absorb shocks. Um, second would be better policy, especially better monetary policy. And third would be good luck in the sense that the economy was just hit by fewer and smaller shocks. But in 2007, 2008, and again in 2020, um, we've seen that large shocks to the global economy are not just a thing of the past, and that they can have not only economic, but also huge social and political consequences. This leaves us questioning both our structures and our policies, and I think it has made people more open to the idea of um, rebuilding macroeconomics. So the overarching question for our session is, are we sure that macroeconomies have self-stabilizing structures, and if not, what does this imply for policymaking? So our speakers are all from Warwick University, but bring very different and I believe complementary perspectives to this question. Um, I'll introduce them just briefly to maximize their discussion time. And then um, each speaker is gonna have 25 minutes to present the research. And then we'll have um, a discussion at the end about the implications of their research. I have a, a few discussion questions prepared, but I can also take some questions in the chat box from the audience. Um, so if you'd like to pose a question, just type it into the chat box. So first we have Nick Chater, a professor of behavioral science at Warwick Business School. His research interests include reasoning, decision-making, and language. And his book, um, The Mind is Flat, The Remarkable Shallowness of the Improvising Brain was published by Yale University Press in 2018. He co-founded a research consultancy called Decision Technology. He is also a fellow of the Cognitive Science Society of the British Academy and on the um, advisory board of the Behavioral Insight Team, which is more popularly known as the NUD Unit. He is gonna be presenting his work called Macroeconomic Implications of the Sampling Brain. Um, so I think I'll let Nick go ahead and then I'll introduce the other speakers before, um, before their talks. Okay. Thank you very much, Carola. Um, let me just see if I can share my screen. Um, let's see. Is that working? Can everybody hear me and see the screen okay? No. We can't see the screen. Can't see the screen. Okay. Let me try something. Let me fiddle a bit further. Um, this obviously isn't quite as straightforward as it might seem. Um, one second. Hi, Nick, this is Carla. Ah, I see, yes. It's the, press the extra button, is that it? Is that now working? Yeah, perfect, we can see now. Right, right, okay. This is obviously a, a track uh, others have fallen into. Right, here we go, let me see. Yes, we're off. So, yeah, so this is, uh, this is joint work with um, other colleagues at uh, Warwick uh, in the psychology department, primarily. Uh, Adam Sanborn, uh, Jen Kiao, Tzu, and Jake Spence. And um, funded by the Rebuilding Macroeconomics Project over the last uh, year or so. And um, what we're going to do is to take uh, a really apparent, rather unlikely sounding um, source of evidence um, about the way human decision making works or human 
behavior more generally. You'll see we're going to talk about something initially at least, which is simpler than decision making. And we're going to ask uh, how that might connect with um, how the uh, how financial markets work or how um, aggregates of people interact in general. So what we're going to do then is look at links, potential links between basic psychological processes and market behaviors. Um, why, why are there such links if they're, if they're real? Uh, is, it, is there a causal link? Is it that the, that the market in some way reflects some aspects of human psychology? I should suspect it may be part of the story, but probably there's other things going on too. It could also be at the other extremes that it's not causal at all, that we're just looking at different complex systems and for various but fairly unconnected reasons, these complex systems have happen to have the same dynamics. Um, that's an interesting, interesting question to, to ponder. Um, what we're going to do, though, is to show you something that I think, at least if you haven't seen this sort of talk before, you'll be surprised by, which is that quite a lot of the stylized facts in financial markets turn up in very simple psychological tasks. So this seems like an important piece of information to have in mind if I was trying to understand the uh, micro foundations of market behavior. So we're going to pick out some classic stylized facts. Um, this is not my area of expertise, so you may have a different set of stylized facts you would prefer, but uh, these seem to be fairly standard. Um, so we have um, volatility clustering, highly volatile events are clustered in time. Um, we also have autocorrelations um, of absolute returns uh, decay to, to zero somewhat slowly. So you get lots of uh, high uh, autocorrelations, but then drift down over, uh, as the time lag increases. Um, it seems that the market looks um, volatility clustering and the next point aside, sort of like a first order random walk. So there are no autocorrelations in returns uh, to first approximation. The power spectrum has a slope of minus two, which is what you'd expect with a random walk. Um, and the standard deviation of returns increases as the time lag between two time points incre it, it grows with a slope of 0.5, which is the diffusion you'd expect with a, with a normal random walk. And uh, the other departure from random walk, apart from volatility clustering we're going to consider is heavy tails, famous heavy tails. Um, and these heavy tails are very hard to eliminate. They're even true of residuals if you fit a Garch model. Um, and you do, interestingly though, get thinner tails, more Gaussian distributions over longer time lags. That's sometimes called aggregational Gaussianity, apparently. Um, so here are those phenomena. Some of you will be very much more familiar with these than I am. Um, and it just illustrated with some classic financial data. This is S&P and Bitcoin, as it happens, just uh, pulled at random. So here we have volatility clustering. So on the left-hand side, we've got a little table of blue, um, some blue highlighted text is the one we're going to be focusing on. We'll just step through these uh, different phenomena, and then we're going to look at the psychological analogs of them. So here we have volatility, volatility clustering. You see on the, um, the left-hand trace plot, little bursts of activity rather than steady change. Then on the other hand, we have um, a power spectrum and um, power spectrum of slope minus two. So that's looking uh, exactly like a random walk should look. And uh, so those slopes, I think uh, this is real data, 2.06 if I can read it, and 2.02. .02. So um, these are real data with really very close to power spectrum. Um, the sigma curve, which is the growth in uh, standard deviation of return over um, when you plot it against the time lag, uh, which with the random walk ought to diffuse as a, um, a sort of x to the half, as it were. So it should have a slope of 0.5. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that um, we have here, I think, uh, point, it's 0.4 in one case and 0.57, but my glasses aren't quite good enough for the job, maybe 0.48 and 0.57, sort of roughly close in real data. Um, heavy tail distributions, what they are all about is departures from the st straight lines in these, in these pictures. So here we have, we're plotting um, the distribution, the actual observed distribution against what you'd expect if you had a Gaussian, perfect Gaussian. And if the real distribution were a Gaussian, then this would just look like a straight line. And the tails, which are highlighted by the blue boxes, which are sort of twisting away from the straight line, they are they are showing you heavy, heavy tails. If they went the other way, they'd be, be light tails. So, and, and finally, we have uh, aggregation of Gaussianity, which is in this data actually not particularly strong, but that's that the degree of heavy tailedness reduces when you move, for example, from um, one trial returns to 100 trial returns. So every time length 
things get a little bit straighter and um, um, gets, the lines get a bit straighter. As I say, this is a stylized fact which doesn't particularly seem to be borne out in the case of our data, but there it is. Now, um, we can now uh, ask um, how we might try and replicate these, or at least examine these, in psychological time series. We're going to start off by considering uh, a re replication of a very simple experiment done by David Gilden and colleagues in the 90s. Um, and this is an experiment where all you have people do is tap at a fixed, uh, in a fixed um, rhythm. So they're exposed to a number of one second, or indeed other instruments are available, uh, and indeed tested, a one second tap. So they have a tap, 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 tap signal. And their task is to join in and then just keep on tapping. Um, and you get a stream of, of data out of them, where what we're going to do is we're going to interpret the gaps between the taps as um, equivalent to essentially prices. So this seems like an incredibly crude thing to do. There's no concept of, there's a, no market, there's no concept of money, there's no prices, there's no incentives, there's no nothing. Um, so it's a really a very different, um, a different kind of data. Now, one thing that Gilden found a long time ago um, was that one thing you do get, which is very interesting, um, but, but not in fact something that connects with one of the stylized facts. One of the things you do get in this data is a power spectrum with a slope of not minus two, but minus one. So this is, uh, this is pink rather than um, classic um, sort of brown noise. Um, so that's, that's interesting. So there's a dis dis so if we look at our second point, so the power spectrum, we actually find we get a different, a different story, one of the creating very great interest in, in psychology. But if you look at some of the other phenomena, um, some of them, they, they do look uh, quite familiar. So we do get volatility clustering, and you can't see it terribly clearly on the left-hand picture, but the, you get spikes of, spikes of activity. Um, you get no correlations in the returns. I haven't got a picture of that. Um, but, the, but strangely, after, in fact, the very first time period, where there is a, a, a negative autocorrelation, everything else is pretty much completely flat. Um, the sigma curve, admittedly, also that is not 0.5. In fact, it's a, here 0.11. This is a, our own data, but replicating this tapping task of Gildens. Um, but we do get heavy tails. And indeed, we do also get uh, a degree of aggregation of Gaussianity too. So we get all of the, uh, the, uh, the heavy tailedness. Uh, but what we don't get is the, the power spectrum of minus 2 and we don't get the, 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 the sigma slope of, of 0.5. So we're getting a, so if you look at the, the table on the left-hand side, we're getting some of those properties just from pure tapping, a pure tapping task with no, no, no complicated social interactions or uh, network interactions or uh, economic thinking of any description. So our next question we've been investigating more recently is to think, well, are there ways in which we can change this task so it becomes, or at least so that the data that comes out of it actually starts to close in in some way, and we actually have this in real markets. Can we do that, again, using extremely minimal psychological uh, machinery? So we're not going to try and build a complicated market with lots of people interacting, although that's an interesting thing to do. We're going to just, just try, try, going to keep it as simple as possible and see if we get those properties anyway, just from within the individual. So here's a new task. Now, this task um, allows us to get away from the fact that initially, with the first task, and there's no real chance for the market to move around very much. So real markets go up and down without real obvious bounds. But if you're doing a tapping task, trying to reproduce one second, you're not going to drift all that far from one second. You're not going to get to, say, five seconds or a quarter of a second, however long you go on, or to some extent, at least that's true. There's a sort of sense of a scale you're trying to stick with. So let's, let's try to change that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get people to, to reproduce a target interval. So we're going to give them a time interval on each trial, not, not just a single um, standard target of one second taps. So on each trial, they're going to get a target interval. They've got to reproduce that target interval. And little do they know, but the next trial will be um, just the same as the previous one, but with a random perturbation. So we, instead of giving them essentially the same um, tapping task, so the identical tapping task right throughout the experiment, so that their task is always to produce a one second lag, just tap, 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 tap. Now we're giving them an interval, they have to reproduce it, and the next one is a random perturbation of the first one. And that random perturbation is just going to be a real random walk. So we're gonna put a random walk in and see if you put that, as it were, through the filter of, of human judgment, what comes out of it. So here's the what goes in. Uh, this is the, the true random walk that goes into the, 
the system. So there's no volatility clustering here. The power spectrum is minus two, of course. So that's what, what random walks are like. The sigma curve is going to be roughly a half. Um, that's, again, the, the nature of the beast. And you're not going to get any head and tails. You get slight um, departures from straight lines in the, uh, the plots on the right-hand side, just because the amount of data is quite large now. It wouldn't be um, perfect, but, uh, but no real substantial heavy tails. Um, so what happens now when we um, when we give this a try? So we're going to test twenty participants um, with two as two specific um, random uh, random walks, um, and here are some some subjects data. I don't want you to to, to agonise really about the, the details of the, these particular people. They're just the typical randomly chosen ones. Um, but you'll see, for example, that looking at the left hand uh, figure, you see it's lots of exciting volatility clustering. Uh, you see a power spectrum which is um, actually now still not, uh, it's still, it's, well, one point, uh, minus one, one point two eight in one case and minus um, 1.85 in another. So even though you're giving them input, which is um, uh, is proper random walk data with a, a slope of minus two, they still impose that uh, minus one uh, slope on it. So somehow there's something about human um, uh, time judgments or somehow something about the sequentiality, sequential structure of human judgments that imposes this kind of uh, pink noise on the system for some mysterious reason. Um, sigma curve still doesn't buck up, still not 0.5, uh, but you, and, and you get a little bit of heavy tailness creeping in, as you can see. So if you look at the, um, the one trial returns in particular, you get a, a little bit of heavy, heavy tailness starting to creep. So roughly speaking, um, and there are some slight complications, there's a, a, the, the picture on the right-hand side, which I won't go into, is um, some recent simulations that you have just run looking at how we can reanalyze this data, taking into account a certain amount of structural noise. But let's, let's leave that aside, it's subtle stuff. Um, so we've got our random walk tapping task, and now we're seeing how it's doing in terms of the various um, stylized facts. And as before, um, it's getting some of them right and some of them wrong, but no real improvement. We haven't made, any, any, um, haven't made a closer approximation of real markets by you know, getting the person to track um, ran a random walk versus just tapping repetitively. Okay, well, let's try something. Sorry to interrupt, uh, this is Carola. Yeah. Um, a couple of people have said that your audio is cutting in and out oh, of it, so if you right. could sit a little okay. closer. Um, is that, and also just, is, you're halfway through your time delay, you know. But yeah, the maybe timing is fine. How am I, is the, is the audio any better now? It's usually fine. I think maybe you just need to stay a little closer to the mic. Okay. Or to your computer, okay. thank I you. I will do my, I will do my best. Um, so, yeah, so let's make another adjustment then. So now, now we're going to turn this into a more cognitive task rather than a, a, a pure perceptual motor task. But it's going to look conceptually exactly the same as the previous task. So instead of getting people, so what we're going to do is we're going to give people, uh, instead of giving them time intervals and ask them to re replicate those time intervals, we're going to give them a price and they have to predict the next price. And the, um, the reality is that the next price is going to be determined by a standard random walk based on the previous price. So this has the same sort of logical structure as the previous task, um, but, uh, but we'll, it's conceptually rather different from the point of view of the subject, because then now they think of themselves as doing a, a, prediction, a prediction task rather than simply trying to, 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 uh, to, to try estimate time intervals. And we're also going to give them um, uh, feedback, and I think we actually incentivize this task, so I'm sure it doesn't make any difference if we did or didn't, but I think we probably do. Okay. Um, oh, yes, I think that's right. We do incentivize. Um, so we do this again with 20 participants, two different time series, in fact, the very same time series uh, that we used before. And now, um, suddenly, everything looks uh, at least much more familiar. We get volatility clustering as normal. The power spectra of suddenly flips being um, having slopes of two, almost exactly. Um, we've moved at least towards the sigma curves having points uh, slopes of 0.5, now 0.31 and 0.4 with these particular subjects. Um, and they're, not, they're, they're randomly chosen subjects, and I think they do tend to be a little lower than 0.5, but not much. And um, we get nice, as you can see, nice um, uh, fat tails, and we get uh, aggregation of Gaussianity, and the fat tails are less fat, uh, on the average, um, for short, um, so for, for, for longer. Um, longer time intervals. So things become more Gaussian as time intervals increase. So looking back at our table, we can now see that um, at least at a crude level, with the same sort of degree of precision as we have with actual financial data, we now do have 
uh, volatility clustering, no auto correlation in returns, power slip of now minus two, and a sigma curve of five ish. Um, and we got heavy tails and aggregation of gas lines. Um, even though this is a task in which all that's happening is a single individual is predicting a single price, and that price is actually moving as a random walk. So, what are we to make of this? Um, I mean, I think, well, I perhaps I ought to, to step back um, and say, you know, we're not going to, we don't want to make very strong claims at this stage about what the connection um, to these psychological tasks are in the market. I think it's really hard to tell, and it's an interesting uh, question for future, future thought. Um, one thing you might say before I go into coming up with some sort of tentative, uh, tentative proposal, one thing one might say is, well, it's all very well having individuals behaving this way, but if, there are, if, if we put them in a market and there are many of them, what's going to happen then? Are the, are the properties we're seeing with single individuals going to um, cancel out if we have lots of individuals? And certainly that's going to be true if you aggregate them in particular ways. So if you just imagine there are lots of buyers and sellers uh, on the, in the markets and there are all, all, all lots of predictors, all predicting away with equal amounts of market power, they've got equal amounts of money then uh, you are indeed going to get some of these, these phenomena to, to, to disappear. and We've simulated that. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a power law um, of wealth for your different participants in the market, so some have lots of, uh, lots of buying power and lots of rather poor, then these, 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 these phenomena are generally preserved. So you get the, the same kind of pattern in, a, in, in the market, uh, a rather crude kind of market, uh, as you do for the individuals. So, that, so, so you do, if you're going to try to preserve the structure of the individual behavior at market level, that does depend on the way in which the, um, in which, the way in which the, the, the people are aggregated together. But it's rather important that, that, that there are some wealthy people who have a lot, and some rather poor ones, uh, as I say, distributed in a parallel way. So is this a re realistic cognitive hypothesis for price dynamics in markets? Well, we're not, wanting to take a very strong, um, strong stand on that. But it is interesting, I think, that these minimal lab conditions suffice to produce, uh, reproduce stylized uh, facts and finance. Um, it's, you know, and indeed, some of the phenomena occur even in very simple tasks, even simply, simply tapping tasks. And these, some of these phenomena occur in whole weight ranges of psychological, um, psychological experiments. Um, of course, to make this a credible story, to say, say something which had any credibility about some um, relating individual decision-making behavior to market behavior, well, first of all, you'd have, um, have to have some story about, well, where's this random walk coming from? Um, so we're imagining that there's an underlying random walk which is kicking us around, and that, well, is that's just a standard first order random walk, where but that's then being transformed to give these um, Start classic stylized facts. Where's that coming from? Well, of course, it could be um, it could be coming from all sorts of sources. It could be you know, exogenous news-like things. It could be could be other things. Uh, but one needs a source of that. And also, of course, we've got an issue of time scale here too. So we're uh, operating over very short time scales in a lab. Uh, now, of course, um, looking at the market market behavior over over months and years, that's a very different uh, different territory. An interesting question there, of course, is how far the, um, the, the scale invariance of the market holds. So is it the case that um, the kind of stylized facts that we're seeing in, in our experiments uh, are just capturing how markets behave at all time scales, or are there some special things that happen at larger time scales, uh, which are somehow uh, have, uh, have different properties, and that's clearly, clearly not, not clear. Um, and also to make this story convincing, you need some sort of sense of where, where does our power law averaging come from? Why is it the case that some people are more influential on the market than others? Clearly, there's, there's this possibility that some are just richer, and that's pretty credible. Um, but it could also be stories in which one's talking about social influence. So it could be that um, if some people are more influential than others, then it's not so much that they've got more money, it's just that other, more other people are following them. Or it could be that there are a variety of columnists and they have a power law degree of readers and that's what's um, you know, kicking the market, affecting the way people, people are behaving. Uh, but you need some kind of um, way of uh, you know, finding a non-flat, power law-like way of averaging individuals together to get these dynamics out. But at least I want just to put um, on the table the fact that it's quite surprising that um, quite a lot of stylized facts in finance keep, seem to be 
creeping in in non-financial context. It's also worth saying, as, as, as Dwayne Farmer pointed out in a previous um, meeting, and it's an absolutely very important point, that quite a lot of these ph phenomena also occur with things like wind turbulence, heart rates, and, either, and other uh, sundry phys phys physical and biological systems. So Robert, you have 25 minutes, and you can go ahead and share your um, screen and begin your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction, Carola, and I'm pleased to see you brought along a young participant. So, um, is my screen visible? Maybe I'll try and go full screen. Thanks. Yeah, so here, um, this is the title of the project that we submitted and was funded by the uh, Instability Hub of the Rebuilding Macro program. Uh, so I've listed all our team members. Uh, and the, the main team member who's done most of the work is Basil Sansom, so I want to thank him particularly. The, uh, we chose the title to challenge the assumption that, of the Instability Hub that what needs explaining is instability. And the reason for this is, as um, Jean-Philippe already said, large complex systems can be expected to be unstable, at least according to our uh, probability distribution formulated by Robert May. So what we need to explain, we suggest, is why economies are mostly stable rather than unstable, because it depends in what sense we mean stability. There's a whole variety of senses that are used in dynamical systems, for example, that I surveyed at the very first uh, meeting of the Instability Hub. But uh, one answer to why economies are mostly stable is natural selection. So I wasn't able to attend the evolutionary uh, session yesterday, but uh, this has been mentioned already today as well. Economies which were too unstable have gone extinct, or at least aspects of them have gone extinct. And what's left is something that uh, is less prone to instability. And uh, part of this is that there are complex systems of regulation and support uh, as we see these days, uh, uh, support for businesses is, uh, by government has gone to extreme levels. I'm not sure they've ever been seen before uh, during this uh, COVID season. So these systems of regulation and support have evolved to try to prevent extremes. Uh, so that's a story that, of course, is very well worth exploring. But uh, what we're addressing here is something different. Are there structural features of the resulting economies that render them more stable? And uh, we propose the answer is yes. And the structural feature is something we call trophic coherence. So I have to give a bit of explanation of this, and then I'll give some illustrations. In ecology, Johnson, who's one of our team and collaborators, proposed an answer to this question about structural features that render systems more stable. And they gave evidence for it. And this is in the context of food webs, uh, where uh, a lot of this discussion started. So food webs, what uh, Johnson et al. show is that they're not typical members of May's probability distribution for large complex systems. They have an overall direction in, on average, and they have relatively few feedback loops and relatively few feed-forward motifs compared with typical members of May's ensemble. And these uh, features can be quantified by something that uh, Johnson et al. introduced called trophic incoherence. And the quantification is that the trophic incoherence of real food webs is smaller than for typical networks. The word trophic means to do with nutrition because of this uh, motivation by food webs. So uh, their, their uh, result is that uh, smaller trophic incoherence, or we could say higher trophic coherence, promotes stability. And um, ecologists' trophic levels, they were formalized by Levine back in 1980, uh, have actually been reinvented by economists. This paper by Antras et al under the name of upstreamness, though uh, Doan traces it back to uh, Leontief's output multiplier. So it's 
older than that. Um, but there's an obstacle to trophic analysis as formulated by Levine and by Antras to applying it to many economic networks. Their methods require basal nodes. So these nodes with no incoming edges or Antras has, uh, has things in the other order. So no outgoing edges he requires. Whereas many, uh, most trade networks, most input output networks between sectors tend to have no basal nodes. So we couldn't even get started uh, applying standard trophic analysis to economics. There's a similar obstacle for financial networks, for example, interbank lending. Uh, and I'm highlighting financial because Angus asked us to address particularly stability and instability of financial networks. So we came up with an improved version of trophic analysis. And I'll run through this uh, rapidly. Given a directed network, network just means graph for computer scientists, but I think uh, network is a easier term for most people to understand. With edge weights, we call them WMN from node M to node N, positive along the edges that exist. The edge weights could be or one if there's no reason to weight them. Uh, then what we do is to minimize what we call the trophic confusion function over assignments of levels HM. So this is the weighted sum of squares of the level difference along an edge minus one. So minimizing trophic confusion is trying to force the level difference between two nodes connected by an edge to be close to one. And we call the resulting HN trophic levels and the minimizing value we call the trophic incoherence. Uh, we found that uh, a Japanese team, Iotomi et al, have uh, proposed essentially the same idea and they have an alternative name for the trophic incoherence, namely circularity, uh, which is, uh, it has some justification. Uh, it's, uh, I want to emphasize it's also slightly misleading. But anyway, if circularity may mean more than trophic incoherence to a general person. And we define one minus the trophic incoherence to be the trophic coherence. This is because we prove that uh, trophic incoherence lies between zero and one. <clears throat> so one minus F zero is a sensible notion of coherence or an alternative name, which is perhaps more meaningful is directedness. So down at the bottom, I've indicated uh, four very simple uh, networks just to illustrate the ideas. So the uh, first one here has a trophic incoherence of zero. So basically, we have uh, um, no loops, not even feed forward motifs. And so it's possible to choose all the height differences along edges to be exactly plus one. So here are the levels we choose in this case, put the mean level at zero. So the levels come out minus one, zero, and one. And then of course, the minimizing value of the sum is precisely zero because we can do it exactly with height differences one. Middle one has a feed forward. Um, the next one has a feed forward motif. And here it's impossible to satisfy all the level differences being plus one. But uh, what we get if we minimize is minus two thirds zero plus two thirds, and the trophic incoherence comes out to be one ninth. Here's an example that has uh, actually a cycle as well as other things. And here, if we do the minimization, we get trophic incoherence two fifths. And then the one on the far right, uh, hopefully my picture isn't, uh, the, the pictures aren't covering everything up. Yeah, that's better. Um, the one on the right is a very simple one, just with uh, a, a loop that goes from A to B and from B to A. So they're on top of each other in this picture. And that, of course, uh, we, uh, if we want to minimize, I'm taking equal weights on all the edges for these examples. Uh, we minimize, we end up putting them both at the same height, and that has trophic incoherence one. So it's uh, maximally incoherent. 
Okay, so hopefully it get, gives you the idea and intuition of what trophic incoherence is measuring. And the advantage of our definition is it doesn't require basal nodes. So these all have basal nodes except the last one actually, but um, let me see, yep. So here's just uh, some illustrations. We took um, the biggest nodes in the USA input output network and worked out their trophic levels, plotted vertically here, and then arranged the graph, the network in some way. Uh, we used weights for the financial value of the uh, connections. And you see things like finance and insurance down the bottom and health and social care at the top. And it's interesting, different countries are slightly different. For example, where education appears is different for different countries. We looked at production networks. Uh, this is pulled off uh, Bloomberg. Uh, and what we did here, the, uh, you can interrogate the Bloomberg database and just get uh, local pictures. So we took a company like this one is Lockheed Martin and then find all the suppliers and buyers within three hops of Lockheed Martin. So in either direction, so we might find a, a buyer and we might look at their suppliers and et cetera, et cetera, the three hops, and then see what the structure looks like. And again, we get trophic levels. Lockheed Martin is the black one in the middle. And it's uh, the question is how things are arranged around here. And we also computed the trophic incoherence, which uh, unfortunately, I think maybe we'll revise this so it's not visible anymore. But uh, here's another one that was done by a master's student of ours, uh, Yuja Jo, uh, this summer. So he looks at a cross border financial exposure network. Uh, this is taken from quarter four of 2008, which is maybe rather a special one. But And uh, what we see is that. Uh, Surprisingly to me, Belgium comes out on as a net, a net lender. Uh, so I'm not surprised Switzerland does, but uh, but anyway, uh, and Mexico as a net borrower, which maybe is not surprising either. But uh, UK and USA are somewhere in the middle, quite heavy borrowers and lenders. So that's to give you an idea of what uh, we get, and um, this one we do. The slide shows the trophic incoherence. So it's quite uh, quite incoherent. This is getting close to one. So the question is, does trophic coherence promote stability? And as I said, for the old version of trophic analysis, then Johnson et al uh, presented evidence, yes. And so what we've done is to see whether the new notion does the same. And uh, the first uh, example is uh, a purely mathematical example. I call it simple contagion dynamics. Uh, it's not a good model for COVID, uh, but it's a simple model where you can get uh, mathematical answers. So we suppose we have a vector X measuring amount of, let's call it infection at different nodes. And we suppose that evolves just linearly using the weight matrix in our graph in our directed network acting on X and then minus the recovery rate. So infection at each node just dies at a certain rate R, but it's forced by catching infection from connected nodes that lead into it. And uh, this has growth rate rho minus R where rho is just the name for the largest real part of the eigenvalues of W. Now, if we want to talk about uh, how trophic incoherence is connected with with the uh, with the uh, with stability, then we need to normalize really because you know we could multiply W by a constant and R by the same constant and all that's doing is speeding time. So it's not really adjusting the stability. So it's a good idea to think of some way of scaling the uh, rho, which we call the spectral radius. So we choose to scale it by the L two norm. Maybe that's a bit arbitrary. I don't have a good justification for it, but um, but uh, that means we define the scaled spectral radius, and then a heuristic argument. So there's not yet a proof, but it's it's um, following lines that uh, Sam Johnson already proposed in the previous case. A heuristic argument tells you that the spec the scaled spectral radius ought to be roughly 
exponential of 1 minus 1 over the trophic incoherence divided by 2. So this is a rather magic non-trivial relationship. Uh, it's expected to be true for typical large networks with incoherence F0. And the curve is plotted here. And the uh, symbols represent data that Sam analyzed from a variety of real networks. And you see they're not too far from the curve. The only exceptions maybe are these metabolic networks. My guess is that's something to do with signs of the interactions, which is something we don't yet take into account. So at least for this toy model with a bit of heuristic mathematics, then, then you see the strong result that scale spectral radius is much smaller for more coherent networks. So it means if we had R, this recovery rate was say 0.4, then everything with scale spectral radius below 0.4 is going to be stable and everything above is going to be unstable. So we wanted to uh, address uh, economic dynamics and financial dynamics. So uh, we looked at various types of economic dynamics, but uh, here is uh, a particular one that uh, I can present. So we looked at uh, employment by sector. So uh, Basil got some OECD data and uh, for Hungary on the left and Spain on the right, then we looked at the correlations between changes in employment in uh, a variety, I think it's 20 different sectors. And the interesting thing is for Hungary, is over the period 2005 to 2015, for Hungary, there is little correlation between the movements between the, in the sectors. Whereas for Spain, there's a much larger correlation between the movements in the sectors. So this is something that uh, merits an explanation. And what uh, Basil found is that actually sector co-movement correlates reasonably well with incoherence. So on the bottom, we've plotted the uh, trophic incoherence of the input-output network for the given countries and uh, which is reasonably stable over the period. And vertically, we've plotted this uh, correlation between employment in the different sectors. And we see, broadly speaking, there is a positive correlation here. The USA is an outlier. Uh, so when we worked out this correlation coefficient, we took the USA out, because that's uh, we don't have a good argument why the USA is so different. but. Um, had to do something. So here we've got correlation coefficient 0.46. And you see in this picture, Hungary is here and Spain is here. So perhaps the difference in the uh, sector co-movement between the two countries is to do with the fact that the trophic incoherence of their input-output networks is different. And this, of course, would uh, provide a strong message to understanding uh, fluctuations in economies. So yeah, that's the moral here. More coherent, or equivalent, we could say less circular or more directed economies exhibit less co-movement of sectors, except the USA, which we haven't figured out why. And so the uh, second uh, example is uh, financial. So, could trophic coherence promote financial network stability? We were asked to come up with causes and cures. So here we're going to propose a cure, uh, not a perfect one, but uh, maybe it would help. Uh, we take a stylized banking system, and each bank has uh, assets and liabilities. We're going to clump these things together into external assets and external liabilities. And uh, each bank uh, borrows from some others and lends to others. Then uh, we simulated uh, such bank exposures networks with given set of nodes, given number of edges, close to given in and out degrees, and the given total value of the exposure summed over the banks, but with varying trophic and co coherence. So the idea is we make uh, networks that are the same in at least the first four qualities and differ only through their trophic incoherence. And then we uh, hit them with shocks and applied a debt rank algorithm. 
So debt rank, uh, you're probably familiar with, is, is a benchmark algorithm for stress propagation. So here what we have is uh, we uh, hit the uh, assets of a bank with a shock. And then we see how this propagates. So it propagates because the ones who've lent to this bank are more worried they're not going to get their money back. And this propagates. So it propagates in the reverse direction to the direction of lending and propagates here, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, when it gets to the end, then we see what's the total value of uh, this equity that's been lost. So the claim is that uh, reduced amplification of losses occurs in more coherent financial networks. So here's the stress test exercise that Basil did. We also vary leverage, equity over assets. We apply a minus 1% shock to all each bank's external assets. We run debt rank and we obtain the total relative equity loss. And here is a heat map. Yellow, it means high equity loss and red is lower equity loss. And it's plotted in the plane of trophic incoherence horizontally and leverage vertically, but in reverse direction, okay? So leverage is going from 0.4 to 0.8 here. Maybe you'd prefer to look at the inverse. Um, so what you see is that uh, you get the uh, biggest losses if you have bigger incoherence and big leverage. So the big leverage is no surprise. But the thing is, for a given leverage, we could reduce the loss in a resulting from a shock by reducing the incoherence. So making the banking network more coherent. So this is our policy proposal. Suggests that a combination of capital requirements, that would be uh, limiting leverage, and a tax or incentives to increase local coherence. I remind you, coherence means directedness, would be good. And perhaps one could implement this, though I defer to the uh, real policy people on this. Perhaps we could imp implement the tax or incentives by a transaction charge on lending that's proportional to the absolute value of the difference to the trophic level difference from one. So if bank A is proposing to lend or borrow from bank B, uh, then there should be this transaction charge, which depends on the difference of the trophic level from one. And this would be an encouragement to go towards a more trophically coherent network. So conclusions, trophic analysis reveals direction in the network and it quantifies directedness, which is uh, what we're calling coherence. Um, more coherent networks seem to be more stable as long as you fix other things. Uh, so I described exactly what we fix in this financial one. And capital requirements could be combined with incentives to make financial networks more coherent and hence more stable. And here are some references. In the paper we wrote about our new version of trophic coherence just came out in Royal Society Open Science. Yuja Jo wrote a master's project uh, this summer. And uh, we have a paper in preparation, which we've promised to Angus by the end of the month on trophic incoherence drives systemic risk in financial exposure networks. So that's it from me. Thanks for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Robert. And um, we've been doing a good job of keeping to the time schedule so far. So our third speaker is, um, Ro is Roger Farmer a professor of economics at Warwick and an emeritus distinguished professor of economics at UCLA. He's on the management team of Rebuilding Macroeconomics and he's written several books, including Prosperity for All, How to Prevent Financial Crises from Oxford University Press. Today, he is presenting the importance of beliefs in shaping, um, in shaping macroeconomic outcomes. So uh, Roger, if you can share your screen and um, you can get started with your talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Corolla. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity here, um, not only being on the management team, but particularly being the hub leader 
of a hub that was charged with looking and investigating instability to tell you a little bit about what I think I've learned from this project. Um, I, when I was uh, started out on the board of Rebuilding Macro, uh, I already had some fairly strong views about how I thought we should reform the financial markets. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about how those views have adapted and changed by interacting with people from different disciplines. Uh, the idea of uh, integrating, uh, rather running a hub along with a physicist is something that I'm very grateful to Doyne Farmer, no, no relation for, um, for suggesting. And um, Jean-Philippe and I have learned a lot from each other uh, and also from other people who've been involved in the hub, which includes input from physicists, mathematicians, management scientists, statisticians and uh, economists. Uh, I'd like to say a little bit, first of all, about the people who are not presenting today. Uh, we, we funded five projects, uh, three of which were connected with economics more closely than other subjects. They included uh, work who, for whom the, the principal investigator was uh, Michael Hatcher from Southampton. And his work involves um, really thinking a lot more about the role of expectations. And I'll try and say something about expectations uh, as we move through this talk. Um, we had a team uh, for whom the principal investigator was Sayantan Gozal, um, which is really quite close to um, stand, I'd say standard economics, but really associated with the notion of multiple equilibria which is another idea that's gonna come up in, the, in the, uh, the discussion that I'll be, um, or the points I'll be raising today. Um, and then a third uh, uh, economist who we funded is Frank Portier, who actually looks a lot, uh, quite closely at some of the things that came up in an earlier talk, um, the, the session before this on um, uh, endogenous fluctuations. You've seen presentations from the teams led by Robert and Nick, and I'd like to mention uh, one other group of people that we've interacted with, uh, and I've learned a lot from, a couple of uh, people working in, in uh, I'd say, models of finance, but coming from a physics background, and that's uh, Maxime and Dimitri, uh, who have been coming along to the sessions that we've been thinking about. Um, I'd also like to say, and I, I regret very much that I'm not going to have time to talk in detail about this. Uh, I've personally learned a huge amount from interacting with Jean-Philippe. Uh, and we have a project that will be coming out as a working paper quite soon, which deals with non-ergodicity uh, in financial markets. Uh, when I gave a title to Corolla for this talk, um, I... Um, thought that I would be basing much of what I'll be talking about, about a, on a working paper that's forthcoming in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. That's the title that uh, she presented, that she gave you um, at the beginning when she introduced me. Uh, and although I will be using some of that work to organize things, I think it would be more interesting and more helpful for the audience if uh, I try to draw together some of the things that we've learned and some of the ideas that I personally have been influenced by in uh, the, the, the whole group of interactions that we've been uh, engaged in in the last two or three years. And I'm gonna pull this together at the end by trying to uh, think about how these, these uh, different perspectives can be pulled together. And in particular, what collectively we might have to say um, about financial policy. Uh, I can never resist thinking about economic history of thought because I think it's absolutely critical to the way that ideas have evolved uh, and also um, the way that we now conduct research, not only in economics, but in, in other social sciences. And economists usually uh, place the inception of our subject with uh, a book from Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, which he wrote in 1776. And here is a, a famous quote from that book. 
uh, which has, has come to really characterize much of what people think of as economics. So Smith said it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Uh, and that idea has been um, really gone in waves. I would say it was denigrated in the last couple of decades with uh, the movie Wall Street in which Gordon Gekko famously, famously asserted greed is good. Uh, and I'd like to be talking a little bit about the sense in which greed is good and in which the sense in which greed might not be good. Uh, and in particular, I'll be talking about the ways that uh, economists ha have attempted to formalize th this idea uh, from Adam Smith, also known as the invisible hand. But I'd like to point out at the outset that if you thought about economics in the end of the 18th century, it was very much a part of political economy and it was not divorced from other social sciences in the way that it's become now. So Smith in particular has a very rich theory of human behavior. And he was after all the author, not just of The Wealth of Nations, but also of a book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. So how did we evolve from uh, greed is good uh, to the modern conceptions of economics? And in particular, uh, what were the intellectual precedents of the way that we now think about macroeconomics? Well, I'm jumping from 1776 to uh, the end of the 19th century in which uh, Leon Voras writing uh, in Lausanne, Switzerland, started formalizing the idea uh, of markets. And Voras was one of the first people to start thinking about what we now call marginalism in economics. Um, but I'm gonna jump over somebody in the middle who I'd like to mention, which is John Stuart Mill. Uh, and, and Mill wrote a very famous essay on liberty uh, in which uh, he argues that we really should listen to all possible ideas, whatever we think of them, and society will be better for it. Now, the reason I mentioned Mill is because uh, in, in modern economics uh, and in the economics that existed around 1860 when, when uh, Mill was writing, uh, there's a, a divergence in the ways that we think about human beings. Uh, Mill's essay on liberty is very much uh, 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 based on the idea that when we talk to each other, uh, I, I might, if I talk, uh, we, we try to change each other's minds. In other words, when we have arguments or discussions, we, we, we explain to each other reasons why the behaviors that we might have taken before we listen to each other uh, might have been incorrect and perhaps we should be doing something different. Now, that is an extremely important idea in, in political economy. And it's one that was really dis has disappeared from modern conceptions in economics. And it disappeared because uh, Valras, in trying to formalize the idea uh, of the invisible hand, uh, introduces a new conception uh, of a human being that has been labeled homo economicus. Uh, and homo economicus, the conception in Valras, is that a human being is nothing other than a, a fixed preference ordering. In other words, if, if you take a group of human beings and you ask them to rank alternatives, and those alternatives could be bundles of commodities to buy in a market, or they could be opinions about politi uh, political situations. But whatever those opinions or rankings are, there's no way that a human being once born is ever gonna make a different set of decisions based on um, persuasion. Now, the reason that that was, uh, although restrictive, a very useful uh, way of thinking about human beings is because it gives us the ability to formalize the invisible hand. And, and that formalization came uh, with um, Pareto. Pareto followed um, Varas at Lausanne, uh, and what, whereas uh, Varas 
is the father of modern general equilibrium theory. Pareto is the father uh, of modern welfare economics. And I'd like to say a little bit about those two ideas because um, they're going to be uh, important when I talk about where we're all going now, and in particular, when we start thinking about intervening in financial markets. So Varas's conception of, of uh, equilibrium is a bunch of people come to a market, maybe an agricultural market, they bring some bread and some butter and some cheese, uh, they trade with each other and they walk away with a different bundle of bread and butter and cheese, uh, and they trade with each other uh, at a set of market prices. And what Valras asked uh, back in, in the 19th century was, uh, is there a, a vector of prices at which the demand and the supplies of every commodity are equal at the same point in time? Pareto is important because he formalizes our modern notion of what it means for a distribution of commodities to be a good one. So Pareto, um, formalizes a notion in which um, uh, it, uh, uh, an, an, a way of dividing things up, and this, this does not involve any notion of ownership. Imagine coming to the market, dumping all the bread and the butter and the cheese in the middle, uh, and some um, social planner or government agent, if you like, allocating the bread and the butter and the cheese, uh, are some ways of doing that better than others. Uh, and Pareto gives us an answer to that question, and it's yes. Uh, and he gives us a, a way of thinking about what's good and what is not. Uh, and basically Pareto's notion of things that are bad are things that are wasteful, things where we could improve the welfare of every human being. And when we're starting about thinking about interventions in financial markets, that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for uh, ways of designing rules or institutions or interventions by government agents that can improve what's happening in markets. Uh, and the idea that what, what market that markets work well, that is the invisible hand, is formalized in, in a, uh, a set of ideas that are taught to every uh, economic student. And that notion is that every competitive equilibrium, that's Voras's notion, is a Pareto optimum. That's Pareto's notion. So I want to, to think, I, I want to think about what I've learned and what I think we've learned from each other in, uh, in the interactions we've had in the Instability Hub by thinking about three threads uh, that I'm going to broadly place work in. So there's the work of my own individual work, there's the work of Cyantan and Michael, and we're all coming from an economics perspective. There's Nick's work that you heard talked about earlier in this session. Uh, on psychology. Uh, and then there's uh, the, the work that Jean-Philippe talked about in the previous session. There was Robert's work uh, and also uh, the, the developments that uh, Gustav and Krugeline talked about when they were interacting with us in the hub. Those are coming from physics and math. I'm gonna take each of those three approaches in turn and I'm gonna ask the question, what's wrong with those approaches? And that's helpful because uh, I, I think we can all learn something from critiques that are coming from other people. I, I know more about economics, so I'll spend a little more time on this part, but I'll also try to integrate that with, uh, with physics and, and math and psychology. Modern macroeconomics, and it wasn't always this way, modern conventional macroeconomics has taken the paradigm of general equilibrium theory and uh, based all of modern macro on, on, on that idea. If you go back to the 1960s uh, and you were taught to talk to the, the, the founders or the leaders of general equilibrium theory, uh, and I'm thinking about people like Frank Hahn at Cambridge or Ken Arrow uh, and Gerard de Brer, uh, they would have been horrified at, at the, the, the way that macro has gone. When they looked at general equilibrium theory, they thought about the equilibrium of an economy in the same sense that a physicist thinks about an equilibrium. It's the end point of a dynamical process. It's something the economy is tending towards. 
Uh, back in the 1960s, most people thought that much of the time, the economy was in disequilibrium. Now, Gerard de Breur, who was one of the uh, people who formalized Voras and really gave us modern general equilibrium theory, he, he wrote a book called Theory of Value. And in chapter seven of Theory of Value, he says, well, look, everything I've told you really generalizes in a, in a very big way. You don't have to think of a commodity as a loaf of bread. You can think of a commodity as a loaf of bread on, on the 4th of April in 2023, if it's raining in Caracas. Uh, in other words, you can give commodities dates and locations. And uh, writing in, in 1972, uh, Bob Lucas changed the whole course of modern macroeconomics by seizing on that idea from De Brer uh, and arguing that we should really think about uh, using that as the paradigm for, for all of, uh, of macroeconomic interactions. And um, one way that we've moved in doing that is by picking up, uh, uh, instead of thinking about a market as a point in time, we picked up ideas that were originally uh, coming from, uh, uh, from well, they're, they're originally they're into Brer, but starting to think about a sequence of markets that open at different points in time. Uh, and that notion is called temporary equilibrium theory. So we think of a market opening every Monday and every Monday people bring commodities to market and they form beliefs or expectations about the prices that they can interact with in subsequent markets. Now that paradigm uh, is extraordinarily general. Uh, and I think that it's one that is well worth uh, maintaining in equilibrium theory. But the distinctions and the criticisms that uh, are coming from psychology, uh, from math, from physics, uh, uh, from ABM models of the kind that uh, Lee and Doyne talked about in the previous session, those are really uh, arguments based on the notion of how things get exchanged at a given week. And I'll call that an equilibrium concept. And the, the Vorazian equi equilibrium concept is that people are rational, they form beliefs based on expectations, uh, and, the, and, and, and at each, each week, each Monday, the quantity of every good demand that is equal to the quantity supplied. There are some newer ideas in macro now that are dropping that. So uh, Vorazian equilibrium is being replaced by notions of search theory. Um, and I, I think it's, it's a very fruitful area, but it's not the only uh, area where things are in a sense in need of change in, in macroeconomics. A second much more interesting one is that every, every Monday when people need to interact, they need to form beliefs about what they will think in the future. And what uh, Robert Lucas taught us or told us was that we should think about modeling beliefs using what he called rational expectations. Now, importantly, rational expectations does not have much to do with rationality. It's a statement that if people were living in an environment that was stationary in some sense, they would gradually learn to be able to predict things correctly. Now that, uh, that notion, I think, is, is, is clearly false. Uh, and it's one of the things that's currently under attack. And I think it's one of the big research areas that, um, that, that many people are working on now in macro. And it's, it's something that can learn, where, where we can all learn from different equilibrium notions and, and different forecasting notions um, that are coming in uh, from other areas of uh, social and natural sciences. The basic problem with using general equilibrium theory as a paradigm is that it's caused theorists to forget that this idea that comes in with Pareto, the first welfare theorem, is remarkable. It's remarkable to think that uh, unorganized societies uh, can sometimes lead to self-organizing structures that are in some sense optimal. 
Uh, and um, whereas that's uh, often true, it's also often false. Um, how am I doing for time, Carla? Um, you have about uh, five more minutes. Okay, good. So let me move on to psychology. Uh, and uh, I'd like to also take, um, disagree with, uh, with something that, that Doyne said in the previous talk, which is that uh, people are obviously not rational. I think many psychologists would say people are obviously not rational. Now, there's a sense in which I think that um, that's both obviously true and obviously false. Uh, and uh, the, the definitions of rationality are, that there are as many definitions of rationality almost as there are words in the dictionary. So rationality is a very broad tent. And at one end of that broad tent is something that is sometimes referred to as the von Neumann Morgenstern axioms. And what those axioms define rationality to mean um, is that people maximize the expected value of a utility function. Um, there's all kinds of ways that could go wrong. First of all, it's assumed that they know the correct probabilities of the events that might occur. Um, but secondly, the notion of, of uh, utility maximizing in that sense uh, is that very narrow sense is the one that psychologists have attacked and ones that people do not seem to, uh, to obey, in, obey in experiments. Uh, at the other end of the extreme, we've got von Mises, the, one of the founders of the Austrian School in Economics, who would argue that essentially all behavior is rational by definition. Human action is what people do. I'm actually much closer to von Mises in that sense than I am to von Morgan Morgenstern. I think rationality is an extraordinarily useful uh, organizing principle. And I'm very skeptical of, uh, I'm afraid to say this, Nick, of some of the, the uh, activities that the nudge group gets into in into sort of trying to adapt behavior because once you get to this notion of uh, people are not behaving ration rationally you have to decide who is going to tell them how to behave rationally and that's an exercise that's led to quite serious problems in the past uh, I, I mentioned here should it be the government should it be the church um, so I, I, I'm, I'm much more of a um, rationality is what people do uh, person. Finally, we get to uh, the kind of work that Doyne and, and Lee Svatsian talked about in the previous session, agent-based models. And um, there's also, I think, a problem, although it's, I, 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 I think some of the things that Lee talked about, uh, I'm completely on board with. She talked about um, agent-based models as being extremely general. And I, I think that's correct. And I'm a, in a minute, I'm gonna to point to uh, a point of uh, connection between agent-based models and modern general equilibrium theory. But my criticism is at least the naive versions of AB, ABM models are not very sophisticated. So people um, have typically been modeled as simply um, agents with very limited abilities to process uh, what I call beliefs about future actions. So that leads me to a, a concluding question, which is, what can we learn from all of these traditions? Uh, and um, there's a sense in which I think general equilibrium theory and ABM models are beginning to come together. So where modern general equilibrium models are going is building much more sophisticated models of interacting agents. Um, some of the work that Ben moll has been doing on heterogeneous agent models are uh, moving in that direction. My own work, which if you're interested, I, I've posted my, my current lectures online. You can go and look at those. Um, uh, uh, it, it, they're, they're worlds or models where people are not only um, heterogeneous in a sense, they're also learning from their environments. Um, so I, I think that general equilibrium models are typically ones with very sophisticated agents, but very simple environments, but we're gradually changing the environments uh, to make them richer. And I see I'm about to be told to, to close up in a second. Um, I would say that, that the ABM models would have relatively dumb agents 
um, uh, um, that sophisticated environments uh, can benefit from moving to um, more sophisticated models of how people adapt. And I, I will close before we move into the policy discussion uh, and talk a little bit about some work that was funded in the finance hub by Mingli Chen uh, and one of my students, Arahan Shi, who worked on that piece and is also working with me um, as a graduate student, are, are thinking about the ability of adaptive uh, artificial intelligent agents um, to, to be uh, much more capable about learning uh, about the changes of the environments in which we place them. So uh, to close up, um, one more slide, I'm sorry. So from a personal perspective, I'd say what as economists we should take away from what we've been doing is that the welfare theorems are remarkable and they are theorems, they are not tautologies. We learn from them that markets often work well and to there I would point to the success of, of China uh, by introducing market systems that pulled essentially 1.5 billion people out of poverty. But I would also point to the fact that markets do not always work well uh, and there I point to the Great Depression and the Great Financial Crisis. Uh, and um, I, I think I'll save uh, what I have to talk about causes and cures for the, uh, the general discussion, because I, I have a number of points that I'm not going to have time to get to here, which are specific ways in which the models we've used have gone wrong and specific cures that we could potentially think about. So with that, I'll throw it open to uh, general discussion. All right, thank you all. Um, these were great presentations. Um, I thought we could just start by um, letting Nick respond to your, your thoughts about the nudge unit. I see in the comments he uh, says he, he's with you, but do you want to elaborate on that at all? Um, well, yeah, I, mean, I, I completely agree with the question, the, the, the challenge. Um, who's supposed to be, who's supposed to know better than the population? I think that's a very, very uh, deep, deep point. I think. Um, you know, the, I think the, the the proper role of behavioral economics, in my view, is to inform the populace, basically us uh, as citizens, uh, about various biases we might be prey to, and various biases that might uh, allow us to be um, to be exploited by uh, nefarious players in the market, um, and to inform regulators and so on. But the ultimate arbiter has to be has to be us. I mean, we have to say, well, this is this this looks like a, like a bias we might want to be. Uh, avoiding collectively, and we might keep falling into it. So in that case, perhaps we ought to put some regulations on um, perhaps it's uh, slot machines or something. Um, totally. But no sense in which we want to say that there's a, there's a, sort of a bunch of technocrats who've decided uh, that they know our welfare better than we do, and, and that, mm. they, that, 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 that that's the sort of, um, that, that's, that, that's sort of arbiters because they've got the special psychological knowledge. I think that's, I, I completely agree, that's a very dangerous perspective and, and not one I want to endorse. So, I think it, it does keep into the Thaler and Sunstein perspective a little. Yeah. If I could say, I mean, I, I raised this notion uh, of e economics becoming solidified uh, with Voras on the notion of an individual as a preference ordering. Uh, and I think that is unfortunate. It, it enables us to very effectively talk about exchange in, in a nice way, but it gives us a complete inability to talk about the ideas in Mill and the ideas that you're leading towards here. So I think one way of thinking about the way I would like to think about an economy is that every Monday we meet and we exchange goods with fixed preferences. And every Wednesday we, we tune into social media uh, and uh, argue with each other. And those arguments sometimes change our preference orderings. Um, and it, it's, it's, that, it's that exchange of ideas um, in, in that, that is a, an important component in Smith and in political economy, which economists have lost the ability to, to even think about to an economist. If you and I talk about something, the only way you're gonna change my mind is, is to um, explain to me some information that I did not have before um, that enables me to elucidate my actual underlying true preferences. And if you think about a human being born as a baby and then becoming a sophisticated person at the age of 20, there's clearly no way that that, that, that washes. We, we clearly change our minds in important ways. That's what psychology is about. Um, 
A sort of related question from Marcus Miller in the comments. Um, he says, Roger, I liked your history of GE ideas, but what about the dissemination of beliefs and the importance of narratives? Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts there about- Oh, absolutely, yes. It's what I've done most of my work on. Um, so th that notion really, it's something I didn't have time to, to discuss a lot. So uh, general equilibrium theory, importantly, uh, empirically infinite horizon general equilibrium theory, which is where modern macro is now, is rife with multiple equilibria. So um, there, there are many things that can happen when, when people take prices as given and are simply reacting um, uh, and, and making the best choices. Um, and uh, when, when you realize that, that that's the world we live in, then yes, beliefs, that is, um, I, I like to think of beliefs as simply uh, ways of forming correct expectations about what will happen. Um, those beliefs feed in and influence um, the macroeconomy in a very big way. Uh, and um, they, they have, I, I guess I didn't have a chance to say this, but the, the big lesson I think I've taken away from all of the perspectives that have, um, people have interacted in the hub um, is that uh, financial markets in particular, where we're trading not only with human beings who are alive today, but other human beings who will be around in the future. There are many good reasons why the equilibria in those financial markets do not turn out to be um, Pareto optimal. So imp importantly, financial markets can be efficient in the sense that nobody can make money from trading in them easily. But that does not mean that there's no intervention that a government could make by designing a good institution, for example, that would improve the welfare of everybody. And I think that's an important lesson to learn from, from uh, all of these takeaways. And while we're on this topic of um, beliefs and policies, um, central banks are even are increasingly in the business of trying to just shape beliefs directly as their policy through you know, communication based monetary policy where they'll use um, forward guidance or the announcement of an inflation target to try to shape beliefs. Um, do you think they're going about that in the right way? Um, or is this is this like a useful path of policy to take? And um, also, are there any other uh, institutions that ought to be doing more to try to shape people's beliefs and expectations. Well, this my own view. Of that. Yeah, did someone else want to say something? Uh, I, I'll, 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 so, if that's a question to me, I would say um, I think unless you actively intervene in the markets in some way other than, than conversation, that you're as likely to have caused problems as you are to. Uh, generate positive outcomes. I, I, my own view is that much of the volatility in financial markets is Pareto inefficient and that uh, the creation of something like a sovereign wealth fund and, and using it to actively manage the markets um, is a better way than simply jawboning the markets and trying to tell them what you think is going to happen. And I think you're seeing we're moving in that direction very much so with um, much stronger interventions by by central banks, which of course raise their own issues, uh, political issues. Um, I see another interesting question in the comments from Andreas Jose, who um, asks uh, about economics careers and the ideas they produce. Um, economists, uh, let me start the question over. A string of high achievements can lead to a high flying career based on our merit, so I suppose uh, he means like an economist who has a string of achievements, gets a powerful career. How much do the panelists think this leads to a monoculture of ideas as we observe in much of macro due to risk aversion for the sake of not wanting to rock the boat? Maybe we can also just broaden the, the, the question to thinking about what are ways to avoid a monoculture of ideas um, in macro. Actually, can I, I mean, as a complete non-macro person and non-economist, non sure. I say something a little bit about that. And I think one, one thing that's quite interesting about economics as a discipline is it seems to be have a much firmer sense of its own or, um, sort of core beliefs than many disciplines do. And and that, I mean, obviously, the, the, these are the kind of core beliefs that we've been, we've been all been talking about challenging. 
Um, but I think it's it's really just not the same in many other disciplines. I mean, psychology, for example, is, has the opposite problem of sort of total chaos. And um, the idea that there are kind of core things that every psychologist agrees on is almost laughable, even in particular areas of psychology, like cognitive psychology or perception. Even within those, there's you know, enormous diversity. And some of that is a sign of um, confusion and cluelessness. Um, but then it's possible for disciplines to uh, give the impression of recovering from cluelessness just by all converging on one set of, of, of beliefs and just sticking with them. Um, so linguistics, I think, is an example where um, Chomsky and linguistics had this, this character for a while that um, it sort of converged on, a, or it converged on a sort of an orthodoxy and got stuck on it. In my view, very, 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 um, with great, with very bad consequences. Um, but I think there is something very unusual about economics as a, as a discipline. It's a very closed world, and seems to have a very particular sense of what proper economics is, which obviously many of the people in this kind of group have been struggling against. Um, and I think that's really very, uh, sort of, as a sort of sociology of science point, that's really quite unusual. Yeah, I'm, I'm... Roger, did you want to add? Go ahead, Roger. No, I, I'm not sure why economics is different from psychology and sociology in that way. Uh, I think I'm quite certain as to why it's different from physics, uh, and that's the, the inability to experiment. So I, I think very often uh, we go off on wild tangents uh, in which we pursue sets of ideas that 20, 30 years later we completely reject. Uh, and that's because we're unable to distinguish different points of view uh, experimentally. Um, uh, I think there's a, there's a good reason for not, there's a good reason for the, the, the monoculture has, has some positive aspects in it, in that if every new graduate student were to go off and pursue their own particular view of the way the world works, we'd never be able to talk to each other and we've benefited from that. But we've also lost out in terms of um, exactly what rebuilding macroeconomics has been trying to do, which is to reintegrate some sets of ideas. Uh, I, I, I wrote a piece a while ago uh, called Post-Keynesian Stochastic Dynamic General Equilibrium Theory, where I was uh, trying to get the post-Keynesians to look at more uh, mainstream views and the mainstream people to look more at some of the post-Keynesian views. So I, I guess I'm contradicting myself in a sense in that there have been different cultures in macroeconomics, post-Keynesianism is one of them, but they've just had no influence on major universities or on the policy debate. And that's, I think, a, a, a bad thing. Um, I think there's been a lot of debate lately about the, um, the amount and type of math that's taught in economics programs in graduate school and what sorts of math um, undergraduates need to take in order to get into top economics PhD programs. And I was wondering if, we're, if we were to move away from this sort of um, intense focus on general equilibrium macro, is that going to um, actually increase the kind of math requirements or change the sort of math that students need to know? And maybe Robert um, would have some insights about this as well. What, what sorts of math classes should undergrads who are interested in macro um, be taking? Well, yeah, that's a challenge question. So uh, we've certainly, uh, in Warwick, we've had uh, quite a few economics undergraduates and people who want to do economics PhDs come to us for, say, a master's year of training in mathematics where they choose options in topics that they think are going to be important for what they want to do mathematically in their economics PhD. So we've been pleased to provide that. It's usually measure theory, actually, is the main thing that they want. But um, I certainly uh, I haven't taken a active approach to advising them. I ask them what it is they think they need and uh, then say, well, we've got these options available with that fit. But um, perhaps I should take a more active approach and uh, I'd, I'd hesitate to um, attempt to dictate to um, economics departments or economics students, but uh, maybe it would be useful if I put together a list of what I consider could be useful. Um, so I do want to make sure we have time to discuss um, sort of more concretely some policy suggestions or policy ideas um, from this panel um, as far as possible cures for instability 
Um, I know, Roger, you didn't have time to quite get to your, all of your slides on those, um, but if any of the three of you have um, ideas about con concrete policy proposals from your work, um, maybe you could present them now. Should I go first or does somebody? Okay, so um, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, obviously. So uh, I, I think that the, the the equilibrium paradigm is useful because of the welfare theorems. Um, and it gives us a way of thinking about uh, arguing about when you should intervene and when you shouldn't. Uh, and if governments are to intervene in markets from an economic point of view, I think it's necessary to explain what's going wrong with the invisible hand. Um, we could say, as uh, the Chinese communists did before Richard, Richard Nixon went to China, that everything should be centrally planned, and that was clearly disastrous. Uh, markets work very well when, when, uh, um, when, when China opened up. But there's also clearly something going wrong in, in big depressions and, and financial markets. And my views on that are there are two things going wrong. The first is that, uh, as I alluded to earlier, the financial markets are not doing a good job. There's excess volatility. Uh, and that excess volatility is coming from essentially the incompleteness of markets in one way or another. That's a, a, an economic jargon term. The easiest way I think about it is that there are people who will be born in the future who will have make decisions um, and we don't know what they're going to do. And there are many things they could do. And we, we, we form beliefs about that. Um, there's also this notion of radical uncertainty that um, there's no way that we can form probability distributions over future events simply because they're not stationary. Um, so th those problems can lead, uh, I think, because of a second problem in markets, which has to do with labor markets. I think it's complete nonsense the way that macroeconomists have modeled labor markets for the past 30 years, with the assumption that the, the quantity of labor demanded in some sense is always equal to the quantity supplied. So there, there's, you can call that disequilibrium, you can call that a need for a different equilibrium concept, but those two things in my view are related. When financial markets go wrong, that spills over into labor markets uh, and can cause highly persistent effects uh, and those highly persistent effects are similar to what, uh, what Robert talked about as roots, zero roots in differential equation systems or roots on the unit circle with hysteresis, if you like. Um, so my policy prescription is to be intervening more actively in financial markets and to, 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 to intervene against the wind to, to prevent big booms and to prevent big crashes. I mean, just, um, Robert or Nick, did you want to add? Well, I will add very little. I mean, I, as a as a psychologist, I'm, I don't feel well placed to make policy um, recommendations. Uh, it, it would, I mean, if it's the case that there is any connection between um, properties of individual um, market participants, or, or indeed um, aggregates who are somehow influencing influencing each other in uh, interesting informational cascades or whatever it may be. Um, then it might be interesting to study those participants and see if they behave differently under different circumstances. So, for example, it might be the case that traders under uh, in periods of great stress or individuals who are um, uh, experiencing great sense of, of psychological uncertainty and instability start to behave in, 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 in visibly different ways at the sort of, um, as it were, the trade by trade level. And that might be a clue that things are going haywire. Uh, whether that actually is a particularly different insight from just observing the market directly I don't know but it seems to me if I were if I were running a, uh, a fund with desks of traders I'd want to be trying to understand whether there's anything in the activity of those people that is telling me that, 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 that things are going uh, you know, things are particularly liable to um, go in an unexpected direction and indeed, so it might, might, might be the, at the moment, I guess, we're just paying no attention to the micro foundations. And maybe that's absolutely fine. Um, but it's possible that it might be interesting to, uh, for example, to, uh, to limit the amount individual traders can trade or to, um, to, to have some sort of circuit breaker if, 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 if trading seems to have a sort of micro level, particularly peculiar characteristics. But I mean, I, I have no idea how powerful or otherwise that might be, but it seems at least worth paying attention to. So if, as I say, if I were running a fund, I'd be interested in that. Um, 
All right, so we have a, a question or actually a, a comment from um, Alan Kerman that I was wondering if uh, Roger would like to address. He says that I have a, an objection to the way you depict the first fundamental welfare theorem. All it says is that if you are in a competitive equilibrium, then it will be a Pareto equilibrium. It says nothing about how the economy would ever get there. Um, so maybe some discussion of how well, how the economy would get there. Um, Alan adds, Debro once told me that he never worked on the stability problem because he thought the problem was unsolvable. Um, so if you wanna take a minute to yeah. comment on that. So, so uh, I mean, uh, Alan uh, is uh, coming for, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with Alan at all. So uh, again, it, it in the 1960s when De Brewer and, uh, and I'm sure Alan had conversations with De Brewer at the time, the, the notion in general equilibrium theory was that, that markets are not always in equilibrium. Uh, and I think there's a sense in which that's obviously correct. Um, but general equilibrium theory, as it was incorporated into macroeconomics, assumed that at every point in time, the market was in equilibrium. Um, and I, I, you know, I, although you, you, you may obviously think that's wrong, it's nevertheless useful to, to have the, the welfare theorems as a benchmark. Um, and um, I, I, I know, can we turn on Alan's mic or not? Unmuted. Hello, Alan. Hi. How's that doing? We can hear you. Right. So I think, uh, uh, we, uh, I don't think we should get into this long conversation, Roger. You and I agree with about most things. But uh, it's just my point is that I think that your idea of the markets reopening and so forth, in fact, these people, uh, had the idea that people had sort of infinite horizons and they, and they sat there now and everything was solved for the future and they didn't reopen again. But then somehow mysteriously you had to solve the problem again next time around. So mm -hmm. it, it, you're talking about temporary equilibrium, which I yeah, think totally. is an idea, but it wasn't the, the sort of De Bruyne and so forth idea. They had this idea these guys had you know, infinite horizons and then they knew everything that was going to happen and uh, that was the way the world worked. And that has sort of disappeared in, in some sense, but in a macro, if I may ac accuse macro, <laughs> there are still many models in which people do have those infinite horizons. And that seems to me very unreasonable. Well, that's what we teach in, in, in first year graduate classes. And it's, it's uh, every single macro PhD student is indoctrinated into that model. Uh, I, I'm completely on board with you. Well, yeah, that's, uh, we, as uh, Bob Solo once wrote to me and he said, uh, I'm disgustingly close to agreeing with you. So <laughs> we have to stop the conversation. <laughs> but uh, um, thank we you had for a... <laughs> So there was also a question for Robert to maybe elaborate on or clarify how you measure trophic incoherence at the country level. Um, and another question about whether you would agree that your results seem to justify the 1930s banking reform, such as Glass-Steagall, that put limits on the connections between institutions. So if, if you want to address either one or both of those um, questions in a, in a couple yeah. minutes. So, uh, thanks. Uh, we measure trophic incoherence of the input-output network for a given country in the way that uh, I described, right? You can say we're minimizing this trophic confusion function and then we take the minimizing value. So it's exactly what our algorithm is doing. And uh, question about uh, 1930s and Glass-Steagall. Yeah, I don't know enough really to comment, but um, broadly speaking, uh, what we're suggesting is not so much limiting exposures of uh, banks to each other, but rewiring in a way that is less uh, prone to catastrophic uh, avalanches. Actually, I have a question, Robert. Does, is, is that an argument for monopoly banking? Would you, would you do better in terms of traffic coherence with a small number of very large banks than you would with a very small number, a, a, a really large number of very small banks? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so we didn't do that comparison. As, as uh, I said, the uh, comparison we did was of networks which have the same set of nodes mm. and the same number of edges and the same total market exposure. So um, we, weren't, we weren't really looking at 
at that question, but that's another thing to investigate here. Then you get into the too big to fail scenario, so. You do. But some people have argued that Canada did better in the Great Depression because it had a small number of large banks as opposed to the US system, mm. which had uh, regional banking. Yeah, well, we should probably do that comparison as well. Yeah, thanks. I would like to say on mm, Pareto optimality, uh, to me, it's uh, not enough to say that the free market is going to lead to Pareto optimum, therefore everything's good. This is not socially acceptable at all. There can be lots of Pareto optima, including one where everyone, one person has all the wealth and the rest have nothing. And it's not at all in, uh, correct to imply, just because it's got the word optimal in, that actually it's a good situation. Yeah, totally. But it, but. But I would add that if it's not Pareto optimal, it is clearly a bad situation. It's improvable. Well, it's not necessarily that bad, but it's improvable. Yeah. I think we're coming to the end of the time here. We have about one minute left. So I was wondering if William would like to give any um, closing words here. Sure, thanks, uh, Carola. So I think we've had a wonderful discussion today and uh, just some brief remarks. I think the, what the discussions highlighted is that we're really going beyond just critiques of traditional macroeconomics to really now talking about alternatives. And uh, we, in the morning, we discussed radical uncertainty, but also that there are narratives of ways of explaining what's going on. We talked about homo economicus, but also that there are now cognitively plausible agents that we can design and simulate from equilibrium to non-equilibrium approaches, exogenous to looking at endogenous dynamics and simulating those with uh, ACE, agent-based modeling, et cetera, where equilibrium can emerge or not as a, an emergent property. And from economics to a much richer interdisciplinary approach uh, where we have psychological processes, physics, ideas from physics and the natural sciences and economics. So I, I think the rebuilding macro is certainly doing a great job in what it's supposed to be doing. And we're getting closer and closer to social macroeconomics. And uh, I'd just like to thank all the speakers today and our chairs, uh, thanks to you, Carola, but also to the uh, rebuilding macro team, uh, Angus, uh, Carla, and Richard, who did a, such a great job in pulling all this together. So I think I'll hand back to Angus. Thank you very much indeed, William. And uh, uh, thank you to um, all the speakers in the panel. Uh, uh, session. It was a great session. And um, that ends our second day of annual conference. And we start again uh, tomorrow morning when we have uh, Caroline Alvers will be the host for the day. And our first speaker will be Sam Beckett, who's head of the Government Economic Service and has held many posts uh, throughout the government as a, a senior economist, economic advisor. And so we're very well placed to give her opinions on the state of macroeconomics in terms of being used for uh, policy diagnosis and assistance with um, uh, people charged with delivering um, that better future that, um, uh, um, uh, that we've been discussing, uh, even if it isn't a, a Pareto optimal. So thank you all very much indeed for um, uh, your efforts today, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. And thank you to you, William, very much for expertly hosted. <laughs>